I was uh, radio and TV in Memphis, but I was freelancing for a theme park called Liberty Land. And I got a call, and they said, uh, the radio station called said, GK, uh, we just got a bulletin from United Press that Elvis has passed away. And I said, oh, I don't believe that. You know, a couple of weeks ago that happened. He was in a hospital, and he got a bulletin, and it wasn't for real. They said, well, can you check it out? Well, uh, no sooner than I hung that phone up, I had five more calls there. They were all for me, and I, every one of them was asking about that. So I took one of the phones off the hook, and I, I called Graceland, and I got uh, Mr. Presley's girlfriend, Sandy, on the phone. I said, Sandy, this is George Klein. Is it true about Elvis? She said, yes, and you need to get out here as fast as you can. And man, I was, I was in a state of shock right there. And I couldn't walk, couldn't say anything, couldn't talk. So I went out and jumped in my car and drove uh, 100 miles an hour to Graceland, walked in, and Mr. Presley was there. And there was turmoil in the little uh, room off the kitchen, and uh, everybody was crying and hugging each other. You just couldn't believe it. And uh, Mr. Presley said, George, we've lost him. And I said, help Mr. Presley, I said, uh, you know, maybe it's a mistake. Maybe uh, they pulled him through by the grace of God. He said, so about that time, Dr. Nick walked in, the doctor. He said, would you all gather around me? We gather around Dr. Nick. He said, ladies and gentlemen, I hate to tell you that Elvis Presley passed away this afternoon. Yes, I do. Uh, I sure do. I was uh, heading home, uh, and uh, I... It was just unbelievable. Now, this is a true story. When I was a little boy, I uh, was afraid to go to sleep in my bed by myself. Don't know what I was scared of. I think maybe the devil or ghost or whatever. But I was also afraid that the world was going to end. And uh, But then I would say, well, the world can't end because Elvis Presley's alive. And, and he's not going to die. So I could go to sleep with that thought every night. And uh, when he died, it was rough. I was actually uh, working in construction, and we had a radio on at the uh, construction site. And the radio announcer came on, and he said, "Ladies and gentlemen, I have some of the saddest news I'm ever going to deliver." Said, "Mr. Elvis Presley is dead." And I hollered out at a buddy of mine. I'm like, "Billy, did you hear that?" They said Elvis had died, and he's like, "Man, you must have heard that wrong." And I'm like, "I'm telling you, they said Elvis died." So I remember it very well. I was coming home on the school bus, and uh, got home and walked in the door. My mother was crying, and I asked her what was wrong, and she said, uh, "Elvis died." I do. I was at my grandmother's house and I remember my mom walking into the front door and when she walked into the living room she fell on the floor crying and I'm like four so I'm seeing my mom crying I'm like oh my gosh and I start crying I'm like mom what's wrong with you? She tells me Elvis died and I thought it was just somebody in our family you know and uh, I was wanting to go to the funeral with her and everything. I, yeah I remember it as Elvis yesterday. I was, my grandmother had passed away about two weeks prior to that and she had gave me a, a little monkey to hang on the mirror of my first car. And I was out, believe it or not, sitting in my car listening uh, to Elvis on the on the on an eight track tape. And I was reminiscing about her. And then my brother had come to the door, and then my mom had followed him out, and she told him, said, "Tim, what your brother's fixing to tell you is the truth." And he said, "Man, Elvis just died." So I grabbed the tape recorder. They didn't have VCRs back in those days, and. I grabbed the cassette tape recorder and went in the house and started taping all the news broadcasts and all the specials and I've still got them all to this day. I was wearing an Elvis shirt. I had just uh, got through talking about him. I had an Elvis shirt on. I was in my dad's store in Moscow Mills, Missouri. Just got through talking about him to a lady who had, matter of fact, on March 22nd, 1976, had ran up on a stage and, and she got on the stage and of course his bodyguards took him off, took her off. We were just talking about that. And I heard it on the radio and I was sweeping my dad's door. And it hit me like a knife. And I can remember it just like like it was yesterday. Well, we were on our way to take a trip to Opry Land and uh, it came over the radio. And I must admit at that time, uh, probably much more an Elvis fan than I am now due to the fact that I did work with a ETA former years, but at that time it was, you know, we've lost a great person. Did I go out and mourn somewhere? Honestly, no, but I knew we had lost great talent, and I did not realize at that time, not maybe being a fan of some of the people I've met since I've been to Elvis Week, all the things that he had done. Then I began to research new stories and 
probably the thing that impressed me the most about Elvis was his love and giving nature. Uh, when I realized that he had gave this money to charities, and someone would mention, well, you know, this is going to be a good tax break. Elvis says, I don't think so. It wouldn't be a gift if I didn't, have, if I didn't pay taxes. So just his love and wanting us to share that love with each other. And that's what I see at the tent. People you don't even know, you can walk up and just start talking to them because they know what we're all here for. So it's pretty easy to see how they feel and share your feelings with them and they'll share with others. As I was working and uh, I came home at uh, 214 West Boone in Spokane, Washington, which is no longer there. But uh, I, I walked into the house and, and my wife Gwen told me that Elvis had passed away. It was a shock. I was, um, many years ago, uh, I was um, on a small island off the UK uh, on holiday uh, and I woke up, had the radio on and then the uh, news broke out. That was it. I was between Detroit and Memphis driving or riding. Couldn't believe it when I heard it on the radio. You know what? I'm getting old, so I don't remember. I really don't remember where I was at. I know my mom cried a river of tears when, when he passed away. And uh, I was very choked up, too, just like everybody else was. Well, just like everybody else, we just couldn't believe that at such a young age, the man was gone. Just graduated from high school. Uh, I was working as a mechanic in Texaco. And, uh, guys always kidding me about Elvis and they said did you hear Elvis died and I said no and uh, so I went next door to 7-Eleven had a TV in there and the ladies were in there were crying and everything and I asked them I says is it true and they said yes and uh, so they had it on the news so it was uh, it was really depressing um, and I could have I never did go to Elvis concert I could have gone a lot of times I just never did that was one of my biggest regrets in my life. I never did go see Elvis. Okay, August in England before 16th of August, 77. Uh, Elvis was still huge. Um, from a, a British point of view, he was, he was making a comeback to rock and roll music. He had songs like Way Down, Moody Blue, For The Heart, etc. So his career, as far as the Brits were con concerned, you know, he was really turning round and uh, going back to his rock and roll roots again. And uh, you know his songs at that time were hitting the charts, but they weren't quite getting as high as they should be. They're still getting in the top ten, but they'd only sort of reach number nine, number seven, or something like that. Um, and then that fateful day on August 16th, 1977, it changed everything. Within a week, Way Down was number one in the charts again. It stayed at the top of the charts for six weeks solid. Every album in the top 20 was almost Elvis Presley. Uh, the week following his death, everybody just rushed out and they, they bought every album, every t-shirt, every cassette tape, every picture of Elvis, every bit of memorabilia you could imagine. So it wasn't necessarily music, it could have been books, etc. But if it had Elvis's picture on it or Elvis's name on it, they bought it. But going back to the music, um, certainly at one point every song in the top 20, sorry, every album in the top 20 was an Elvis album, at least for a week. I was 16 years old. Um, we were probably getting. I was probably getting ready. In fact, I'm sure I was. I was getting ready for football practice uh, or, or something like that. It would have been that time of year. And um, I just remember coming home, and that's all you saw on the news, all you heard on the radio. The devil was gone. It was a really sad day. I was working at the grocery store. Uh, a friend of mine, who was off that day, came in the back door, and he he was kind of looked really oh, kind of pasty white and he he said he said Brian he said he said Elvis died and I said yeah right you know like like he was trying he knew as a fan and I thought he was trying to play some kind of sick joke and and uh, he said no I mean it and I remember just sitting down you know back there in the back room and just thinking like somebody had punched me in the gut you know and then just, just within minutes, my dad, phone rang and my dad called me. He had heard it at work. And uh, when, I, when I heard it from my dad, I knew it was the real deal. And of course, after that, everybody that was coming in was talking about Elvis dying. It was, 
you know, let's, let's face it, that's it was huge news. You know, everybody was upset. So. When I heard Elvis had passed, I was on my way home from school. I believe in 77, I was a freshman in high school. And on my way back home, uh, I, I just remember getting home and finding my mom. I'm very upset about it. And of course, like a lot of those moms, are where it starts at is where you first get your exposure. And she was a big fan and it upset her. And, and it upset a lot of people. It made me feel uh, feel pretty bad as well. But uh, I remember not believing that he was dead, not believing he could be gone. And, and at an age that I've already surpassed, I think my own mortality. Going, you know, there's there could be there could be anyone that could go at any time, and you never know when your time's coming. You just have to always believe it and keep going on. By the time I heard it, it was somewhere around three or four o'clock in the afternoon and they announced it on the radio. I was in a store. Um, I caught, I mean, when I heard it, I walked outside. There was, I didn't have a cell phone, but there wasn't cell phones back then. But I called, there was a little pay phone right there next to the store. I called and I, all I heard, I, and one of the secretaries answered and I said, this is Billy, is it true what I heard? And they said, yes. And they said, you need to get here as fast as you can. And so I dropped the phone and just, stood by the car and I cried for a little bit and then I got in the car and then headed to Grace. When I got there, uh, both my brothers were standing in the backyard and I walked up to them and started talking with them and then Lisa Marie pulled up and wanted to know if we wanted to ride in her golf cart. It's no, not, not, not right now. Obviously it was shocking to a lot of people but it I think it just became a, a reality for everybody that, you know, he, he embodied youth and he embodied fame and people began to understand the trappings of, 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 the, of that type of lifestyle and, and he, uh, you, you, you know, again, you know, people grew up with him, he represented a lot of different eras and, and I think it just really you know, pe people thought if it could happen to him, it's going to happen to me someday, you know? So, uh, you know, it's just like when you walk through Graceland, you see his jumpsuits and you don't re realize that, you know, he he was 6'1 or 6'2 and, and, you know, walked on two legs like the rest of us. Um, I actually was swimming in a swimming pool and uh, remember uh, very, very vividly, I was, uh, it jumped, actually just jumped into the water and I remember my mom coming down and, uh, she and her sister they came out and told me she said that Elvis had died. And being that young of an age, I didn't really know what that meant, but I knew it was something bad because I could tell by their face that something really bad happened. And uh, so it was just a uh, little times in everybody's life that uh, we, just, we just lost a legend. I was in the kitchen washing dishes, and it come, I had my radio there, and I come across the news that someone had said that like an ambulance had first come up to Graceland and of course a lot of people didn't think too much about it because his grandmother was there at Aunt Delta and then and a few few minutes later it said that, it, that there was a problem with Elvis and then like within 15 minutes they came across and said that he had passed away and it was just like it was breathtaking because you're in the house and you hear this and you think oh my god you know what, what could it be and then when we found out it was Elvis several of us went right down to the gate and of course we got through the gate just right at the gate at the uh, entrance to the gate and uh, of course everybody knew who we were and they verified us that he had passed away. I was just a little little tight so I just kind of grew up not really paying attention to that aspect I was just appreciating him for who he was and you know just that whole thing you know so it really didn't take effect until like now coming up to the visual and seeing the the impact that he had on so many millions of people, it's just amazing. When I heard Elvis passed away, I was on a vacation in uh, Scotland, and uh, it was the very next morning, we were down having breakfast with my family, and the lady who won the hotel, she let us know that Elvis had passed away. But because of her deep Scottish accent, I thought she said that Elvis, she was putting the toast and marmalade on the table at the time, and I thought she said Elvis Presley bread. And I just looked at her and I thought, it doesn't look any different to me, but, uh, then the new sunk in that she actually said Elvis Presley is dead. Wow. And I cried all day. I was uh, playing baseball in a baseball field when I heard it die. Uh, on the way to play ball. Okay, in 1977, the day I heard Elvis passed away, I was uh, 
just had went to trash go early that morning and around I guess it's went to trash go from eight to five and I guess it was around three forty five, maybe a quarter to four, that uh somebody in trash go came up and told me that Elvis passed away, had died. And I, I kind of was shocked for a minute. Sat there and just kind of collect my thoughts. After that, I called a friend of mine and I checked out of trade school about, I guess, about 30 minutes early. And I called him, went and picked him up, and went on to Memphis. We got there about almost about six, I guess a little bit after six. Got there to the gate. There was about 15, 20 people there when I got there. And uh, we started talking to them. Uh, then we went and got a room when we came back. And I guess around seven, eight o'clock, right before it started getting dark, man, there was so many people there, you just, you just couldn't walk up and down the sidewalk. I was on the road. I was actually doing shows. Uh, you know, we played little bars and uh, we played conventions and things like that where it was more than just an hour thing. Uh, I always did a lot of other stuff also. And then this was the highlight, you know. This was the Saturday night last show, go home afterwards, that we'd do that. So we led up all week of other things and then that was a big thing. We were on the road. I was in Indiana traveling when I heard the news. And of course, uh, I had actually been singing some of the albums beforehand, but I, I designated 1974, February 14th, because it was close and it was a good sized show that I was doing as my beginning date. And all that time, all I wanted to do was meet the guy, uh, and, which I never got to do. I, I saw the show in 71, and I saw his show in 1977 in Indianapolis, which was the last one. And it was kind of ironic that even though I didn't get to meet him, shake his hand, uh, I'm actually from Indiana, so from the Ohio River area south. And it was kind of, you know, I, I guess maybe it was meant to be that I was able to be there on the last show. So that's kind of how it, you know, uh, kind of got started. And I was in a book called The Rising Sun in Hazel Grove, and it was about 20 past 10 at night when I got a phone call saying that uh, King of Rock and Roll was dead. Reported dead. It was only the very last bit of the news. And then afterwards, um, it was on Radio Caroline. I sat up all night uh, listening. They cancelled all advertisements. And uh, I listened to the whole show all night, right through to the morning. And I just couldn't believe it. Man, I know how it affected me. You know, I mean, I. There's just so many different aspects of it. I mean, I just wish he would. I wish he was still here. You know, I mean, he is in a sense in spirit, but you know, I'm just thankful that uh, you know I got to see him and help change my life, help save my life, and I, I will never forget it. And I will die. I'll go to my grave, you know, respecting that man and thanking that man for what, you know, thanking God most of all for giving that man to us and helping us, you know. Because some people out here that don't understand Elvis, you know, they think it's kind of weird. You sit here and you tell these stories and they don't get it, you know. Well, I know they don't, but I get it and uh, millions of others get it. And, um, I think it's a great thing and I think it'll never die. I was living in North Little Rock at the time and uh, I was at a swimming pool, a community pool, and I had just dove off the diving board when I heard he had passed away. And I hit the water too late to hear any of the rest of it. I'm an electrician and I was on my way home from work. I was working at a nuclear plant in Tennessee. And uh, it, was, it was really hot that day and I was driving home and uh, yeah, that's when I heard it. Matter of fact, I was reading a book about Elvis, uh, and, uh, and I was, at, you know, I was sitting at work, and uh, every day at, during lunchtime, I was reading the book, and some paperback, and uh, everybody's making comments about it. And, uh, then I was driving home that day, and uh, yeah, I heard the news. Yeah, it was really sad. It was sad. It was sad. Actually, I worked for the Decatur Home Review newspaper. I worked there 40 years, three months. It was about 1:30 uh, or so, and they started getting. Uh, 
This is the old pay a AP uh, news uh, uh, typewriters, uh, teletypes back in them days. Um, and one of the editors came over and said, Fred, said, we're getting something over the, the teletype, you better come look at it from AP. So I got up from my desk, I was in sales, advertising sales, and I walked over to the AP and I started reading. I said, nah, this, this can't be right. I said, I would have gotten a phone call or something. And then later on it kept coming in, they, they started sending the photos over the AP Newswire, that, that's how everything was done back in them days. And uh, sure enough, it, it was true and I just got up and left work. I think I got paid for it though. <laughs> and I told him also in my contract that I get off on it, I don't work on Elvis Presley's birthday. That's a holiday for me. But anyway, <laughs> and everybody understood that. I was a fan, they knew I was a collector. Uh, Decatur, Illinois is kind of a depressed area for Elvis, so they always turned to me when they had a question about Elvis. And working in a newspaper, you got the news pretty fast. You know, so that was a, my first time, and I'll never forget it. I just went home, and my kids knew what had happened. And, and uh, that, that, that's what happened. I remember vaguely uh, August 16, 1977. I was probably about three or four years old. And I remember TV commercials went to a news flash saying that they had some sad news for the world and that Elvis Presley had passed away and that's all I remember. I think with us living in the UK, we were totally shocked when Elvis died. We, we didn't see it coming at all. I think in the USA, a lot of people did see it coming because they'd seen him in concert. They'd seen what shape he was in at the time, but we just seen pictures. And the only pictures that they were relating to us in the UK were pictures sort of pre-1975 um, and that was the albums that they released at the time it was always the slimmer Elvis you know and we we, we were just in awe and uh, of the guy and when he died I think everybody in the UK was touched in some way or another and we didn't expect it at all. No. I was with my mom at her friend's house and uh, they were in the kitchen having coffee and uh, I was listening to stereo I was only uh, I guess eight years old at the time and uh, Heard on the radio, I ran in, screaming at my mother, I started crying, crying, crying. It was all almost a blur, but I know where I was. Yeah, I was at my mom's friends. I don't forget her, even her name, but. <laughs> I was working in my family business. We had a, a wholesale retail business of uh, fruit and vegetables business, and uh, I was working, and I heard that he had passed away. The next time I saw Elvis alive, it was about three days before he passed away. I came up to Graceland to visit with Elvis, talking about a personal matter. We went up in his bedroom and had a great talk, and uh, he told me he was getting ready to go on tour, and I told him what I was doing at that time, and, and three days later he passed away. Now I think what was really cool about the whole thing is how nice the people were for one another. That's, that's what I think was cool. Like I said, uh, you know, he was standing by the gate, and, uh, by the wall, close to the gate, and didn't want to lose the spot. But when somebody wanted to come up and sign the wall, they kind of moved back where you could, people could come up and do that. Everybody was so nice to him. That's, that's what I think. So many it was just like a family. I was um, sitting in uh, a chair watching TV. Watching, uh, I forget what I was watching, but the news, this special bulletin came on, and I stood up and I said, Elvis is dead, before they even announced it. I just, for some reason, I knew. Uh, I remember it very well, like most people do. Uh, where were you when Elvis died? I had just uh, registered for high school. My mother and I had moved from another part of Memphis. It was just she and I back then. Mom was a single parent and uh, working all the time, trying to make a living. And she was at work that day, and it was a Tuesday uh, because uh, you had to register on uh, August 15th and 16th, that Monday and Tuesday. And I think it was A through J last names on Monday and K through Z on Tuesday, and that was me. And I had walked over to my new school, Central High School, which is. Uh, the north end of Elvis Presley Boulevard called Bellevue. Uh, I had just walked over there and it was a half a day just to get your registration for your classes and walk around and see where all the classes were. And big monolithic brick structure. I'd never seen a school like that. Four stories and and found my way around it. I had wandered home maybe by 12 or so and I had been laying on the couch uh, eating snacks and watching reruns of Gilligan's Island and stuff like that, you know. 
and uh, I guess it was two or three that afternoon when a local di uh, television reporter on Channel 5 here in Memphis, I remember the man's name, his name was Dick Hawley, uh, broke in with a special bulletin and the first announcement was that Elvis had been rushed to Baptist Hospital uh, and the early reports were that he was suffering from uh, a respiratory problem and when they found out more they would break into programming to let us know what was going on and it was one of those special bulletin break-ins very brief and so I called my mother at work and she was had a lot of friends uh, some of her girlfriends she ran around with were uh, nurses at Baptist and they had all of course met Elvis at one time or another uh, mother just loved him so much so I called my mom at work and it took a while to get her on the phone and she came to the phone and I said mama they just had to rush Elvis to the hospital we had tickets for a concert he was doing in Memphis uh, in a week or so thereafter at the Mid-South Coliseum Elvis was still here and so we had our tickets and I remember mother and I talking about wow I wonder I hope it doesn't you know do anything I hope he's better by then so we can get to see him again and uh, and while I was on the phone with her, they, I saw the special bulletin uh, chroma key come across the television again. Special bulletin from Action News 5, and I saw Mr. Dick Hawley, uh, t uh, before they ever got to him, he was taking his glasses off and dabbing his eyes with a handkerchief. And I thought, oh no. Before he ever opened his mouth, I had the body language told what he was about to say. And my mother came home immediately from work, and by 5 p.m., we were at the gates of Graceland. Uh, the road was still open, the highway was still going, Elvis Presley Boulevard was happening at 5 o'clock. There was uh, maybe 50, 100 people there, and we stayed till 2 or 3 that morning of the 17th before going home and having a few hours of sleep. We returned the next day, all day, all night. We were there when those poor girls got hit by that drunk driver in front of Graceland, right there, uh, you know, just a matter of yards away. And then we returned, the, of course, the third day and uh, and stood on the side of the road like everybody else for the funeral. My mother and I actually got to see Elvis lying in state. We were some of the few, we now know a few people, they say 20 something thousand, I think they claim now, uh, they got to go up and see Elvis lying in state. Mother had made some friends at the gate over the course of the couple of days, true Elvis fans that couldn't leave the area. <coughs> Pardon me. And I remember uh, Mother and I having to fall into a single file line walking up the driveway. Elvis's Uncle Vester and cousin Harold Lloyd uh, had a, a escorted us kind of up the hill and we were probably some of the first 100 people in the door. But as we filed in, we had to make a, a single file line, people passing in and coming out the front door. And we went through and as you turn to the right in the living room, there in that doorway, they had a uh, like a velvet rope, like in a, like in a movie theater. Uh, and they had a Memphis police officer on one side and they had a Shelby County police officer on the other side and Elvis lying in state well into the living room uh, in that big beautiful casket and flowers everywhere the whole place was overrun and you could actually hear uh, family members um, emotionally uh, expressing themselves and crying and stuff throughout the lower floor there in the house uh, people moving in and out but as we came out uh, back onto the Elvis's front porch and the single file line trying to get a little organized out there uh, say 50 people back just off the steps uh, mother saw the ladies that she had befriended they had fallen in the line well behind us and I remember to this day it was like it started right then they were saying it wasn't him was it it's not real it can't be true it's all a big fake. That's not him. What, what he looked like? What was it? Was that him? And uh, we were speaking with her, or with the ladies, uh, as we walked along, and fell into line again with them, and went through a second time. And I remember standing on my tippy toes, trying to look over there, 
I remember at that time looking a little closer and he seemed so young there uh, lying in state. It was overwhelming uh, even for a 15 year old little knucklehead like me. Long hair and listening to Led Zeppelin and stuff every day. But it, that was uh, my hero and it was very, very profound and, and emotional for me too right then. And that's what I remember most about the 17th of August. I was in the medical center, I was in the lab uh, working and I was painting the lab, believe it or not. I, I remember people started calling me that day and I couldn't believe it. And I turned the radio on and uh, said he had passed away. And it was sad and I remember driving home that day. Uh, I was in traffic, bumper to bumper, and every radio station was playing Elvis music, and I was just looking over, and everybody was crying. Women, men were just, you could see they were just uh, like losing a real close family member. It was really sad. Where was I? I was at Graceland, uh, eight hours before he passed away. I had been through some difficulties with uh, drug rehab. I was a pretty wild teenage kid, and um, I was there at Graceland and I relayed to him my, um, a young girl who was a member of Bellevue Baptist Church uh, had been praying for me for a long time because, you know, she knew my life was a mess. And um, she talked with me and uh, I thanked her. I said, thanks for praying for me and all that stuff. And, um, and I went upstairs and I told Elvis about it. And he looked at me and he said, Ricky, those are the people that care, that talk to you. Now that surprises some people, the spiritual side, but as a minister, that's one of the most important things that I convey to people is that Elvis had a great appreciation and love for the Lord. And um, that we had that conversation. I uh, went downstairs, you know, probably got high or took pills or something. and. Um, I uh, got up, my brother David came in, I said, uh, we're supposed to get him up at three o'clock. I ran to Grisanti's restaurant near Memphis. And before the food even got there, I said, um, I've got to get back to Grayson. I've got to get back. I didn't know what it was. I'd never had anything like that happen before. Never had a premonition, never anything. And uh, so I just stood up, put the money on the table and left. And then when I went through the gates, I saw that big ambulance. And then that's when I walked in and the stretcher was coming down. And, and that's when Lisa Marie said, Ricky, my daddy's dead. And I said, not stuff funny. I was just with your dad, you know, you shouldn't get around like that, Lisa. And she said, Ricky, I'm not, I'm not kidding you, daddy's really dead. So I was there at Graceland uh, when it happened. And, um, the guilt, you know, that I felt, you know, uh, what if I'd have checked on him one more time? It was It was incredible. I mean, uh, he had told me, he said, Rick, don't bother me. If I need you, I'll call you, which was code to me. He was going to spend some intimate time with Ginger. And uh, contrary to what people say, at Christmas Eve, of 76, I was there when he gave her the engagement ring. He was very serious about her. Now, a lot of people w wanted to debate that, but I was there when he did it. Um, but I thought he was going to spend some time with Ginger and didn't want to be interrupted and there was going to be intimacy. So that's why I, I didn't bother him. But it lingered for a long time. It took me a long time to get over. What if I'd have just went up one more time and to check on him, but I didn't. So it, it took quite a while to get over that. I know exactly where I was because August 16th is my birthday. The day Elvis passed away is my 19th birthday. So I was in boot camp, United States Marine Corps in San Diego, California, the day Elvis passed away on my 19th birthday. So I know exactly where I was and what I was doing. And like most people, if you ask who were around that time, knew where they were, what they were doing when they heard about Elvis. Yo! Uh, actually, I remember that day very well. I was uh, 10 years old, and um, my father had taken a vacation day uh, to uh, spend the day with us. We went down to uh, Seven Caves uh, in Cincinnati, and then we came back, we were playing putt-putt, and uh, we were on our way home from that. 
um, when we heard it on the car or on the radio in the car on the way home? Uh, I was at home. It was in the summer. I hadn't started school yet, and I remember the phone ring, and it was my wife's, uh, excuse me, my mother's uh, sister. She called and said, "You got to turn on the radio. You won't believe it. Elvis has died." And we really went and turned on the TV, and we just couldn't believe it that somebody like Elvis was, was dead. You know, we thought that Elvis was not a real guy. So how could he be dead? He's only 42 years old. It was just an incredible thing and a sad thing. Well, yeah, it's pretty emotional when I talk about it. I did it at a show last night. I have to kind of hold myself in because it was on my birthday, July the 5th, 1976. And we had just finished a tour. And the last date on that tour was at the Mid-South Coliseum here in Memphis. He did a great show. We went back out to the house in that white, long Lincoln limousine. We went in the front door. And he's going up the steps, got the towel around his neck, the jumpsuit still on, his, his sunglasses. And uh, he always, when he came home from tour, when it ended, he always would just relax uh, for three or four days, stay upstairs and read and relax and kind of wound down, you know, from the tour. And so I said, well, boss, I'll see you in a few days. He said, yeah, I'm going to get some rest. He said, happy birthday, Sonny. And I said, oh, but I said, thanks, Elvis. I said, uh, you, uh, you're going to want some of that cake that, that uh, Judy baked, my wife baked. He loved her cakes and pies. He says, oh, yeah, Linda's going to bring me up some. He was referring to Linda Thompson, his girlfriend at the time. And uh, I said, okay. He said, I said, well, just take care. He said, okay, see you. And that was it. The last time I spoke to him, I saw him alive. Okay, uh, when I found out that Elvis had died, uh, I, as soon as I heard, I had to tell my sister. I went home, told her, and I had to get the money for us to make the trip. We made the trip. We was almost to Memphis, and she wanted to turn around and go home, and I wouldn't let her go. I said, no, we come as far, we're going all the way. So when we got to Memphis, batteries was dead on the camera and uh, we went down got the batteries to replace them in the camera so I could take pictures and uh, when we got back we parked on the opposite side of the road and that's when I met the girls when I got outside of the car I was standing at the back of the car and I met the two girls that had been killed and they walked right up to me and just started talking to me as if they'd know, know me and we carried a conversation and turned around and they went on their ways and then I seen them as I walked out to go across the boulevard, take pictures. And I walked up, met them with the police officer. We started talking. And from there, things just happened. When how, how, how bad were you injured? I had head trauma. I had a right craniotomy, which was brain surgery. Uh, my pelvis was broken in four spots. Uh, my muscles tore up in my right thigh. I was on the lake skiing, to be honest with you, Lake Ferguson, Greenville, Mississippi, and uh, some friends pulled up and said Elvis had died. And I was like, get me to my house, man. And it just, it's like when President Kennedy got assassinated. You remember where you were at the day that he died. In front of my home, my parents' house, where I lived at the time, uh, changing the carburetor on my 68 Cadillac convertible just gotten off of work. It was a very, very hot day and a news flash came on the television and then the phone started just ringing off the hook. I was in the kitchen with my mother and it came on the TV and I, actually I was unloading the dishwasher and I heard it on the news and my mother stopped doing what she was doing. She was cooking dinner and she stopped doing what she was doing and she said, oh my God. And it was, you know, I'll, I'll never forget it. It's one of those things you never forget what you're doing. And you know, the little menial thing of emptying a dishwasher is stuck in my mind forever. I remember the, the, the day that he had his, so, well, first of all, I was one of the ones that were in the line to go up and view Elvis, which was uh, just inside the house underneath the, the chandelier. I was at home cleaning house and I didn't clean house that day. It was just, uh, I was stunned. My kids were stunned. And it was just like, everything stood still, that you couldn't go about your daily 
activities because of this news. Um, Elvis has such an impact on people. And it's, I don't know, it's just, I, I, I really can't explain it. On the same day that he passed away, he had went to the racket for little that day. At morning before I got there, him and Jenny and Billy Smith, they went to the racket field. And they come in, come in, after I had got there, come in the house and he says, uh, I said, how you doing this morning, Mr. Elvis? He said, I'm doing all right. I'm kind of tired and hot. He said, I said, would you like some grub? He said, no, I don't want anything to eat. I just want some water. So we fixed some cold water and take and the other maid taking it upstairs to him. He was in his office. So uh, other than that, that was the last time I seen him. I do. I, uh, was just, you know, of course, it was August. and. Uh, I was about 16 years old, and I was sitting on my front porch step as I used to leave my door open. Lived in a little, lived in a little house, kind of a shack in Texas, and I was just sitting there and I heard the radio. People talking on the radio said the king of rock and roll is dead. The king of rock and roll is dead. But they really didn't play any Elvis songs at that time, that particular time. And I go, king of rock and roll, king of rock and roll. And back then, I guess I really didn't think. Of, it wasn't. I mean, if it, to me, I didn't know it was King of Rock and Roll. It was just Elvis Presley. So um, when uh, when I kept on listening to it, I thought maybe it was Chuck Berry or Chubby Check or somebody. I don't know. Strange, right? But anyway, when I heard the Elvis, it was Elvis that passed away. Man, it really hit me. It was. I was sitting on my front porch step. I was at work and I heard it over the radio, right before I came home from work. I was out on the carport and I heard it on the radio and it just. My heart just sank. It's about 12, I think. Do you remember that day very well? Yeah, I do. I sure do, yeah. What, what, what were you doing when you heard? Well, when we got it, uh, it was about, uh, it was very early morning. I was lying in my bed and father came through and told me the, the king of rock and roll had died. Uh, and I just couldn't, uh, it's quite hard to believe. I was sitting on the machine, on the freezer that had the ice cream in it because I was working in a restaurant at the time and the radio was right next to me when they announced it. That's what I was doing right at the time. I was on a little bit of a break. I was seven years old. Do you remember it at all? I remember that day just like everyone. Um, my mother actually came in my, my room. I was actually in the bed <laughs> asleep again um, and uh, told me about it. I remember that day. I remember being in bed. I had, we had, bunk, I had bunk beds and I was sleeping on the bottom bunk. And my mother came in the room and said, Elvis had died, seven years old. I do, I was in kindergarten. I remember it was 1977, I think. And I remember a little bit about it on the news. I knew somebody really famous passed away, wasn't sure who it was. I remember mom saying something about it. And then they, they, they talked about it at school. And uh, it's been 30 something years ago. It's been a while. And uh, I vaguely remember it, vaguely remember it. Uh, but, uh, it's My father had had open heart surgery. He was in Birmingham. Uh, and I was staying with my brother, who had two smaller children. And I was watching the children for him while he and his wife were doing something. And um, I was sitting on the couch watching TV. And the children were in the floor coloring coloring books when the news came on. And I just couldn't believe it. It was just. It's so unbelievable, it's just like shock. Well, I was working in our electronic store, uh, record store, and uh, a friend of mine called me and told me we had televisions going all over the place, and all of a sudden it uh, came on the air, and we had about 15 or 20 televisions on, and it was, you know, it just shocked me, and uh, of course, we were just kind of stunned and didn't know what to what to do. It was kind of like uh, Elvis is not supposed to die, and it just took a long time for it to sink in. We had to go home that night, and before it really sunk in, it was just more than you could, you know, take for a while. I was uh, I had I was doing working a um, a summer job. Uh, for the little town. I was living in a small town called Level Plains, Alabama. 
and I worked for the city uh, when I was uh, I was like uh, what 16 at that time, and uh, um, it was a sh it was a slow day, so they let us off a little early. So. What I used to do, I, I would go home, and I get home from school, I'd go back in my room, put my record player on, and I would play disc jockey. Uh, that's how I try, finally got into the radio business, but I used to, I wanted to be in the radio business. I, I get back there and pretend I'm a DJ, and I have all my records and all. So I'm back there with my door closed, and all of a sudden my uh, brother and my mother, my, uh, I think my sister was there, they come up, open the door and said, drum, drum, said, uh, they just said on the news that Elvis died. And I, I look at them, it's like, first, first response is like, you're crazy, you know. I said, I'm like, ah, I thought they were just joking. And then I saw my mom's face, and she was serious. I thought, well, there may be something to it. So I turned on my, the radio station that I always listened to, and the guy that I became friends with later and worked with in radio later was on the air, and they were playing an Elvis song. And I thought, oh no, this is not a good sign. Um, so when the song ended, um, he came on and said. Uh, uh, there's the uh, there's Elvis Presley and I think it was already lonesome tonight. He said, by, by the way, if you're just now tuning in, the news out of Memphis, Tennessee, that Elvis Presley died today uh, at the age of 42. And I'm thinking, oh, I just it just it just tore me to pieces. I mean, I remember I cried for days and uh, uh, I thought I, this just can't be. How can he die? You know, and that, that was the the thing that was running through my head. You know, this was a superstar. This was the guy that I idolized. How and that. How in the world can that happen? And uh, it was uh, it was tough. And that's and I remember the song I was playing. Also, I was uh, when I was uh, playing DJ in the room. I was playing Ronnie Millsaps. It was almost like a song. And every time I hear that song today, I mean, I love the song, but it it takes me back to August 16, 1977. I was in uh, North Carolina when my best friend's mama passed away. We went out there to pay a visit to his family out there in North Carolina. I heard it on the radio. It was a joy. At that time, I wasn't really a heavy fan at the time, but yeah, it did affect me, even though I wasn't a real heavy fan at that time. I was uh, digging a footer with my cousin in uh, Orlando, Florida, and uh, we had music on the radio, and we were digging a footer, and I heard um, Elvis had passed away, and I'll never forget that day, and I know exactly what I was doing and who I was with when it happened. Uh, I was at school, uh, school assembly, standing in line uh, just before school uh, commenced, and uh, I, I think it was the principal who came across and made an announcement that Elvis Presley had passed away this morning. I didn't believe it. I thought it was they got it wrong. Um, it wasn't until I actually got home and my mother said, look, did you hear Elvis passed away? And then I, I cried, to be honest, and uh, my father was still at work and he brought home the newspaper from that day and it had all the articles and lift, lift outs. Uh, the news was, you know, it was all over the news and that sort of made it real to me uh, at that point. I was at work. I was working at Jack's in Centerpoint, Alabama. I'll never forget it because came across the radio, TVs, and everybody at work just cried. I mean, that's all anybody could do is cry, and I just really could not believe that he had passed away. It broke my heart. It just broke my heart. I was driving a truck for a cabinet company, and I heard on the radio, and uh, when I got back to the shop, people were Run up to me. They were running up to me and asking me, "Did you hear Elvis died?" I, I didn't believe it. I, I thought, "Man." So when I got home, it was true because my, my brother was home from the Navy and he had f recorded the whole thing on the radio. So then I, ooh. I know that I was uh, just getting home from school and I thought I was in trouble because my mama was crying. I didn't know what I'd done, and then I uh, found out a little later. Not that I really knew who Elvis Presley was, other than a man that sang his song my way. And I thought that was the last song he ever wrote. Elvis's death made Elvis a bigger star than he was in life, yes. Um, it, it gave him a boost for his career, let's say. Um, as I said, Elvis was always having hits in the UK. But the rest of the world, you know, Elvis could have been as... Um, a has-been kind of guy, he's had his day, now make room for somebody else. Uh, all of the faithful fans stayed with Elvis, such as myself, and we knew that Elvis's popularity would just grow and grow. And I remember saying at the time, I was 15 years of age when Elvis Presley passed away, and I cried my eyes out all day. And I remember at the time saying, 
this guy's music is just going to get bigger and bigger because they're not going to let him die. And they didn't. I was in my neighbor's backyard playing on the swing set, getting beat up by my, uh, my little uh, uh, girl that was a neighbor. And uh, my mom came out and told me that uh, Elvis was dead. And uh, I ran home. And uh, we all couldn't believe him. We all cried together. Oh, yeah. I was uh, 14 years old. and. Uh... A friend of my, a friend of my father's, come running down the driveway. We were at my parents' cottage, and they, he comes running down. And says, Bobby, Bobby, uh, Elvis died. Elvis died. I'm like, you can't, you can't. Elvis didn't die. You're joking with me. No, no, no. Turn the radio on. Turn the TV on. You know. So it was. Uh, I mean, it was just a shock. You know. We all rushed to the TV set, and you know, crying and all that kind of stuff because, you know, Elvis doesn't die. 33 years ago, uh, August 16th. I wasn't working for Elvis. Um, I was working at the airport. But I was going to help him get ready to leave. So I was on the way to uh, Graceland, but I stopped at a convenience store to get me a coat. And when I was in there, it came on the radio. And I heard it, and I knew the guy that was the, the clerk there, and he did because I just I froze. I mean I couldn't believe what I heard. And he, you know, he said my name two or three times pretty loud, and then I kind of came to. And he said, "Billy, you need to call Graceland." So I walked out to the car in a phone booth and called Graceland. And I don't I remember it was probably one of the secretaries because it was a lady's voice and she was crying. And all I can remember saying is, "Is it true what I heard?" She said, "Yes. You need to get up here as fast as you can." As soon as she said yes, I just dropped the phone. I turned around, walked outside, I mean, walked out of the phone booth, and my world right then had just come to an end. Well, I was a bartender for 26 years, and I was bartending, and they had broken into a song and said that I was personally had passed away. And I yelled out, you know, I was personally had passed away, y'all shut up. And shut up, and even my mother said, well, you must have misunderstood it. And then after the song was over with, they came back and said it was confirmed that he had passed away. Well, I couldn't work the rest of the day. You know, I had to take off because I was so upset. And uh, you can see now I'm tearing up. I just, you know, it just upset me so bad. I was in Tupelo, Mississippi at my home in Lake Bingo, breaking the yard. I think I was in my living room back in Perth, Western Australia. I was 10 years old and it came on the radio, Grant. I heard it then. Yeah. Well, I was in, in, the, in, the, in the Alps, and I was uh, skiing, actually, at the time, and, and I was uh, drinking some stops, and, and I heard it on the radio, and, and I started crying. Well, I was in London, and uh, I was um, I actually came back from a record fair that evening, and I had a lot of Elvis stuff with me, a lot of EPs, and they came on the news, the, the English news, the uh, ITN, with Reginald Bocas, he said the news that Elvis is dead. He said, first of all, he's, he's ill, or he may have a heart attack. He said no more, but then there was a news flash, and he said he was dead. So I went down to a record shop where I was, and I bought up every Elvis thing, and he didn't even know he was dead. And he was the first manager with Thin Lizzy, a guy called Teddy Carroll. He had a shop called Rock On in London, in Camden Town. And I, I bought it, as I walked out there, I said, oh, by the way, Elvis has died last night. He said, yeah, I said, I might die as well. He didn't believe me. But I left it at that, till he went out and bought the paper. And he said, you bought all my stuff, I could have made money. Well, I said, I paid the price you were asking for. I already told you he was dead, you didn't believe me. I was coming back uh, to work from a doctor's appointment where I hurt myself and uh, pulled into the parking lot, sitting in my pickup truck and they announced the news. And uh, the old heart went, Toom, you know, just like that. So it was pretty amazing. Uh, Elvis's death affected the world in a great deal. It was a uh, state of mourn and everything else. Uh, folks around the country lowered their flags. And I mean, it was, it was a very hard thing for a lot of the fans that he had finally passed away. I was in the swimming pool. Of course, it was August, of course, uh, it was hot. I was in uh, my cousin at his house swimming. And um, my mother and my aunt came out of the house and I noticed that they were talking and they looked very sad. And, and I got out of the pool and I said, I thought one of our family members had passed away or something because they were it looked like they'd been crying, and I walked up and I said, what's wrong? And they said, Elvis just died. And I thought, I mean, at that time, being a young boy, I thought, I knew who he was, uh, but I thought, man, that's, and right then at that young age, I thought, 
man, a, a legend has just died. And I even they, I knew what a legend was, and I thought a legend has just died. Um, so, you know, I said a family member earlier, really Elvis, to a lot of people, you felt like Elvis was a family member to you because you were raised on Elvis. Uh, kind of felt like he was a cousin of you or, or an uncle or whatever. But uh, it, was a, it was a sad day, but uh, through things like this, he continued to keep his memory alive. Uh, keep his music alive, and uh, I listen to Elvis every single day. Uh, it's not a day goes by I don't listen to Elvis, and um, just enjoy his music. I'm a fan first. 1977, I was in my mother's brand new Trans Am, uh, outside playing in the car when she come running out saying that Elvis was dead. And uh, I think for the next year, I think we had a uh, uh, pretty much a memorial every week for Elvis. Again, uh, my mother was uh, sort of an Elvis groupie. She went to over 82 Elvis shows. In 1973, took me to my first show in Atlanta, Georgia at the Omni International. And uh, at that particular show, uh, my mother received Elvis's microphone off stage, and that's the very microphone that I use at every show. Well, like I say, I wasn't I wasn't a real Elvis fan at that time. I remember doing it. I was I was just uh, I had, uh, was in high school. And uh, I remember right after he passed away, and all the stuff on on television and stuff. And so I can't tell you that you know where I was the day he died or anything, I, because it, it didn't stick in my head. But to a lot of people, it's like, all right, JFK and RFK getting shot, and and Elvis. You know, it's they know exactly where they were, what they were doing. You know, my manager, she spent you know two weeks just in tears stopped going to work it was like it was like life had ended for for all these Elvis fans it's like they're oh my god so if we can bring a little bit of him back in in paying tribute to him then, then if we can be just like a dim reflection of him then we're doing a good job because he was just an incredible incredible performer sure do I was uh, sitting in my living room that was uh, actually just being built my mom and dad were adding on to their house and I was sitting in that living room and it was just a wood floor with no drywall or nothing just the studs and I was sitting there watching the TV and I had just gotten home from school when the announcement came over and I remember running around the house crying and screaming no no but it was true so I sure remember that day I was uh, <laughs> getting up ready for for work about 6 a.m. in the morning and, and put the radio on and uh, putting my welly boots and stuff on. I, I was a tractor driver in them days. Uh, wonder about all the commotion was because this same guy kept coming on and on and on in the, the radio and they were talking about him. As I said, I thought he was a movie star, you know, and all these songs have been, I've never heard these songs before. Just you know, uh, listen to him all day when I was driving the tractor. Was, the whole day was on. Just amazing. Yes, I know my wife will say the same thing, but we were in my grandmother's kitchen and we heard that Elvis had passed away and we couldn't believe the that God had taken someone most powerful on the face of the earth away from us. Well, I just know growing up that uh, everybody remembers where they were on certain dates, like 9-11, you know, everybody knows where they were at. Well, if you ask them where they was at when Elvis died, they know. So it's pretty amazing. I, I don't think he'll ever die because his memory will live on. I owned a boutique in Metairie, Louisiana, and one of my employees called me and told me that she had heard Elvis had passed away. And I said, can't be true. And uh, I said, they're always saying rumors like that. And she said, no, it's true, and unfortunately, I, I called Graceland, I was not able to get an answer. I called the guard house, I called Vernon's house, and I called friends until I finally got somebody and found that it was, it was true. Okay, actually, I was working on cash registers. I was a mechanic all my life, but I had got out of the business for a while and I was working on cash registers. And uh, I was driving a van down the road and going to a stop to work on a cash register and I heard it and I didn't believe it. I mean, actually I still don't believe it. <laughs> but, but it took a long time to sink in and until his actual funeral and I actually seen the funeral procession and all, it, I, it didn't really sink in. That's what I was doing, I was driving down the street. I was still living in Mississippi. No, no, I'm telling it wrong. I had moved to Florida by that time, and uh, we, you know, we heard it on the news that Elvis.
years had passed away, of course, everybody was just devastated because he was our, he was our hero in our time. When Elvis passed away during this nice, it was a nice August day, uh, it, it made me more wanting to know what, what he was about. And so uh, uh, I wanted to look more into who this guy was, Elvis Presley. You know, I just didn't know really who he was. It, it was hot. Uh, it ain't as much hot as it is now. You know, it was probably in the mid 90s, 95, 99, something like that. A lot of us drank water. And, Went across the street and stayed in the little shops and stuff to keep covering. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, we kind of just rotated at the gate. You met some friends there, uh, they let you go eat, you stay there, you come back, you stay in their spot. They went and ate. It was, it was real nice, people were real nice to one another. That. What really impressed me during all the time of that, about, uh, Everybody was signing up the names around the walls and stuff. You know, you had people that wanted to get there, and, and the other people standing by the gate would move out uh, by the wall, would move out of the way for you to come up and sign the gate you know, around the wall. That so I thought that was kind of neat. Oh, I, I was actually uh, driving in a car, and and I heard it on the radio, but I didn't think that um, you know how the the pranks were back with um, the Beatles saying that Paul McCartney died. So I, I didn't think too much of it until they broadcasted it on the news on TV. So I heard it on the radio, but I just, I didn't take it seriously. So I thought it was just, you know, a publicity stunt. You know, Kerry, it was so frustrating because I wanted to be here so much, and I'm sure everybody else did as well because we were so far away. The only thing that we could rely on at the time was the TV or the radio, uh, I mean, the radio was playing Elvis's music 24/7 for, for you know for weeks after. We'd go out and buy every single newspaper that we can. We watch every single news bulletin on the TV. But it was all the same. You know, it was very very frustrating that we couldn't be here, and it made it worse. Really, it really did. And uh, there, was, there was just no end to the grief at the time. I never thought that. I never once thought he was going to die. Uh, I realized that he'd gained some weight. I'd seen pictures. I never did see him in concert, which is one of my big regrets. Uh, but I used to, you know, whenever there was something in a magazine or the newspaper or something, I always followed that. And I uh, uh, never once dreamed that I never even thought about Elvis dying. You know, some people you just don't think they're ever going to leave. You know, so no, that never entered my mind. That's why it was such a shock. Uh, I was in the backyard, uh, my mom's house when I was still living there, and she said Elvis died. And uh, I kind of just like let it go. I just didn't even want to think about it. That was about it. And it wasn't probably not until uh, the 25th anniversary of my first visit here uh, that it actually sunk in and he actually really died. It was a total surprise to me because, like I said, I saw him on the 14th and he was up in, a good, in great spirits, uh, looking forward for the tour. And, uh, I mean, I heard it on the radio. I was going to Graceland to help them, because that was August 16th, and that, that's what I did on the 16th, or whenever they left. I would go there and help them pack up, uh, load the uh, luggage and stuff up in trucks and take it to the airport. I was in the photography business at that time. I was living in Denver, Colorado, and uh, I went to a customer's house to do a family picture. And when I walked in the door, the lady said, Elvis just died. And I just, I just like everybody else, I was in shock. I told her that's the worst thing she could have told me at that time because I had to make them laugh in the pictures. And uh, I wasn't in a laughing mood after I heard Elvis had passed away. So. I was at home, my home in Maryland. When my son Kevin came up to tell me that uh, he had just heard on television that Elvis had passed away. And, uh, oh, of course, I was sad, like everyone else, sad and, uh, and disappointed that such a thing had happened. And uh, I thought of El well, it, it was it was really very sad because you know there was my child there telling me, and uh, he was maybe five years older than uh, Lisa Marie, and 
and I just, you know, all these thoughts went through my mind, but mainly I thought Elvis will never see his child grow up, and God willing, I will see mine grow up. And it still makes me sad, as you can see, to, to think of that day, but uh, we're, we're not in control. And so we, we, we live not as we wish, but as we must. Yeah, I was at work, and I got a call from my mother. She called work because she knew I'd hung out with them and all, you know. And uh, I was, you know, in shock. I mean, you know, I even left work and went to his aunt's house, uh, Lorraine Smith, and uh, we hung out there a while. You know, everybody's pretty sad. I think it affected the world in, I guess, a lot of different ways. There, there's positive effects and there's the negative effects. Of course, we lost one of the greatest men in music, but we've got all this. <laughs> and uh, to me, that's a big deal that he had this much of an impact that, uh, what is it, 35, 36 years later? Four. Um, shows how much I know. We're still doing this. <laughs> We're still doing this. That, that's insane to think about. Elvis's death changed music quite dramatically. At the time that Elvis died, there was um, a thing about punk rock being the next big thing to rock and roll. Well, punk rock was big, even though it wasn't my, my taste in music. Uh, it lasted a couple of years and it disappeared. Same with disco music, it lasted a couple of years, it disappeared. Same with soul music, soul music still popular as it ever was. Where it's it's in the back. It's in, you don't read about it in the press. Um, if you're a fan of soul music or Motown music, great. You know, there's lots of clubs you can go to. But there's not a single day goes by, whether it's in the UK or whether it's in the USA, that an Elvis song is played on the radio, played in somebody's car, played in somebody's home, or anywhere that you can play Elvis's music. It's been played continuously around the world, up and you know up to today and beyond, it always will be. And uh, Elvis music, yeah, I think it's getting bigger and bigger. I know for a fact that EPE are looking for new ways to promote Elvis to the kids, um, which is why they do the remixes. Sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's, it's not so good thing because it's messing about with classics. But we all have our opinions about that. But if we can get Elvis Presley to the masses and to the media in, in a good way without when I say that, you know, we're going back to his music because that's why we're an Elvis fan at the end of the day for this fabulous music that he left us. And that's what we've got to get to the masses, not the other jumpsuit image because there was only one guy who looked good in a jumpsuit as far as I'm concerned. And anybody who knows me knows my feelings about this, that they are very, very strong. And uh, the only guy who looked good in a jumpsuit to me was Elvis Presley. Well, I think it affects it more than we realize because it's, I mean, look at it 35 years later and there's, you know, what, 50, 50 60,000 people, they say, going to be out here tonight, probably. I was at home in South Haven, Mississippi. We passed away, me and my mother, my twin brother, and my sister came to grace to this state at about 10, 11 o'clock at night. Can I get a photo with you? That was, I got home in my uh, he's interviewing, he's interviewing. Uh, I got home from work and my wife called me on. And at the time I didn't have the money. She was my ex-wife at that time, rather. And she called me up and told me. And I told her, I said, well, I didn't have the money. She gave me the money to come down. So. Did you get to go in? No, not the first time. There was too many people here. No, it was, I mean, it was pandemonium. I mean, it was a mob. It was just a... I guess controlled mob, that was about it. I know where I was. Um, I was living in my, um, my house on Hopkins Road and I was wallpaper in my kitchen and I was cutting out the wall receptacle at the time that I heard it. I think it rocked the world of music. Uh, it almost made them bigger, larger than life. Um, you know, if, if there's anything good to take from it, uh, then he, he, he went while he was in his prime and uh, we can all remember him as such a, a magnificent entertainer. Walking in the door of my apartment, Nightway Apartments. My tickets had just come two weeks before. They were laying on the table, which I still have postmarked from Mid-South Coliseum. And I turned the radio on and I heard it. It was, it, of course, obviously, it was all over the news, the newspapers. And 
and everything else. I guess, you know, you could ask most anybody that was around in those days what they were doing and one of the, uh, kind of like President Kennedy, uh, you know, everybody just remembered, right? Right where they were and everything that was going on when that happened. And all areas, I mean, with music, uh, with the movies, um, it affected everybody, I think. Uh, Everybody remembers where they were when the day he died, uh, and it just affected, uh, I think, just the way we do everything as far as listening to music and so forth. It just, uh, it just really, really saddened the uh, United States and actually the world. The morning that he died, okay, he was uh, playing racquetball down in the uh, racket building. Him and Billy Smith, his cousin, he came up to the house. I was in the kitchen, and. He wanted some he wanted some water, but he told Billy Smith that he was going upstairs, he needed some rest. Billy, Miss, Billy Smith said, well, I see you, boss, later on, because he was planning on leaving. And uh, after he went upstairs, I told the other maid to take some water up there to him. So he was upstairs. In his office at the time, he was reading a book. It was something like a religious book. So later, he did not call down for anything. I asked him, did he want anything to eat? And he said, no, he just wanted to get some rest. So during that time, sometime, that he went to his bathroom up there. Jenny was up there at the time. And he sit in his bathroom and he read this book. But she thought probably he was still in there reading. Uh, but uh, she didn't call down to me to 10 minutes to 2. So, as the people say, he had passed away like 9.30 that morning. So it wasn't in the way to think that we could do, you know, to, they tried to uh, survive him, but it was too late. I went up there when Jenny called to me. I went up there and looked at him in the bathroom. And I run back downstairs and I called the other bodyguard and he went up there and he come back down to me. So we called Joe Esposito in. So Joe Esposito went up there and they couldn't survive him. He was already gone. When Elvis passed away, there were people came from miles and miles everywhere. The streets were lined with people. And uh, the day that he had his funeral, I went to, up to see the casket and see him and everything just laying under the big chandelier, she go in the front door. But the day of the funeral, we were all outside and we could see, we couldn't see everything, but we could see movement up by the house. We could see when they brought his body out. Everything was so quiet, and all of a sudden, something hit one of those trees, like a bolt of lightning or something. It was the biggest crack we ever heard of one of the, like, one of the limbs stout right in front of the casket. I mean. It was awesome. It was just awesome to see, you know, to see something like that happen and just not it had to be something that was meant to be. I've never seen anything like it in my life. It's 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 like the whole world lost uh, somebody they were really really close to. So uh, I still miss him today. I, I I try to find music and songs that you know they play through Sirius Radio that uh, we've never heard. It's kind of cool to hear something I've never heard before. And uh, I can't explain it. It's just it's a loss that you're always going to feel. Well, it was like it was like part of uh, you lost your best friend, everybody's best friend. It was like he was part of history, part of society. It was like you losing the president, or uh, like John F. Kennedy dying, or, or it was in that in that scale. I mean, God gives us special gifts every now and then. Somebody comes along. Elvis was one of those special gifts, and when he left. It was like part of our soul left. I was at the airport waiting to go on tour. And I noticed the, the plane from Los Angeles with the Los Angeles musicians simply did a touch down and took back off. But Felton Jarvis, the head of the tour, got off the phone and said, due to an act of God, the tour had been canceled. The colonel didn't even tell us then that he was gone. So I heard about it on the radio on the way home from the airport. Oh, back then, no, it was it was on the radio quite often, and then uh, the major shows back then, you know, with uh, David Brinkley and those kind of guys, it was on for the evenings like that, and uh, you know, it was carried on for quite a while actually. Even up in my area, New Hampshire, it went on for at least a, a good week, and then of course, 
later on in the year they released the that last concert that wasn't going to be televised. It was made for television to begin with. They weren't going to televise it, but after he died, they ended up putting it on the air, CBS. I was in the uh, I was in the army. I was in, uh, in Northern Ireland, um, getting bombed by our own. So, and but I still had time to uh, have a little cry. You know, somebody asked me that yesterday, and I told him, you know, I was uh, I was 22 year old. I was at my house, uh, sitting on a couch watching Bonanza, and, uh, and a special bulletin come across and said the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley, had died. And it was just a big shock. Uh, the day I heard Elvis died, I was employed at a cottonseed oil mill. I worked a swing shift. I was at home asleep. And uh, I'd just gotten off the night shift. It was about 3.30 in the afternoon. And my sister called me and woke me up uh, and, and told me about the news. Uh, my sister and I both are big fans of Elvis. She knew I'd want to know. But um, I was at home uh, getting, getting a good night, a good day's rest after being up all night. And that, that's where I was when I heard about Elvis' passing. And it was it was very shocking to hear about it. It was sad, but it was uh, it wasn't so much a surprise because he, he had gotten to a point where uh, we were we were very concerned about him, having been around him the years I was, and uh, I was very concerned about his health. Uh, but it, I thought that's where it was. I was at home. It was like the day that the King Elvis Presley died. Is like me when Buddy Holly died. That was the day the music died. And I compare it like that because he was the king of rock and roll. There's other bands that will tell you they wouldn't be who they are on TV, records out, if it hadn't have been Elvis Presley. Uh, we got to go through the house uh, right before. They had a funeral around 1.30, 1.45, something like that. And they let the first 200 people that was at the gate, they kind of followed around and uh, let us go up. Uh, they let us go in the front door here. Uh, a bunch of them uh, that was there, uh, I guess when we was there, we seen uh, Ann Margaret, them come through the gate, Wayne Newton. Uh, there were several of the big entertainers that came. And uh, I guess they had them maybe in the jungle room or somewhere else, but they let us come through the front door and uh, file around here, and they had it kind of blocked off. There was a guard here and a guard there uh, on the other side of Elvis's coffin. They let us go through, and the only thing you could do, they told you do not touch anything, just go through, look, pay your respects, and then go out the side door. At the time, the side door there was by the swimming pool, the swim, you know, swimming pool right here. And uh, at that time, they didn't have no memorial garden like they do now there. And they just filed through, you got to look, and you got to go out the side door and then back down the road there through the gate. I, my son's birthday is the 15th of August, and we were coming back from the lake on that day, I mean, actually his, it was the 16th because we were coming back, we had his birthday at the lake a day late. So I was coming back to Huntsville and I was on the highway and I heard the song, um, they were doing, they were about to play a song and they said, and this is by the late Elvis Presley. And, and I just, I, I just could, I, didn't know what to do, so I pulled over at a service station and just sat there and started going through the, the radio channels and, and I heard another that Elvis had died at like 2.35, he was announced dead at, in Memphis. And I went home and cried and watched TV and cried and watched TV. <laughs> His death, when you got so many people going down to see him, still to today, there's never been anything been effective like that. And um, I think it just changed the way people express themselves in every form of life. And I think Elvis had a lot to do with all that. When Elvis Presley passed away on August 16th, 1977, a part of me passed away as well, as I'm sure it did with any Elvis fan. I, uh, I was broken hearted, even to this day, 34 years later. Um, 
it still leaves me with sadness when I think about that day. It's uh, as if it was yesterday. Uh, time has flown by, you know, like that. Um, and I really f felt at the time that a member of my family had passed away. The only other time I felt like that was 11 years later, um, in October of 1988, when my own father passed away. Um, again, I was devastated. My, my dad was my best friend, and you could say Elvis's music was my other best friend, and the two were very closely linked together. And I, I, I was, it was the end of my world. Twice it happened to me, and that was when Elvis died and when my dad died. And it's a feeling that never leaves you. Uh, listen to my Elvis 8 tracks, you know, uh, that dates me right there. But uh, I just listen, seem to listen to them more and more and more, and I'd just let them roll over and over and over, and I was learning the words to the songs, uh, you know, just by osmosis. I was just sucking it up, and uh, I started singing with the 8 track player and uh, found out that I could sound like him and I think had, had it not been for all of that happening I wouldn't be doing all this stuff that I do down here in Memphis now and so yeah, I think it made a made a big impact on, on my life you know I think about Elvis every day and uh, it's it's and I think a lot of people do it's it's like it was like losing a, a, a friend uh, or something like that. I mean, it was not like here's this entertainer that nobody know. We don't know him personally, but we're just you know uh, stuck on him and can't think of anything else. But it's not like that. It's like it was like losing a friend and who has made a big big impact on your life, and you just um, you know you just think about him all the time. You can't help it. You know because you loved them so much. I don't think anybody has ever impacted music in the world like Elvis Presley did. I don't think there'll ever be another Elvis Presley. Uh, you can count them on one hand, Elvis Presley, Frank Sinatra, Johnny Cash, and there's a few others I'm missing. But where I was at, I was in Wichita, Kansas. I was teaching guitar lessons at Calavan Music. And I walked in to teach my lesson. I was about 18 years old, I guess, maybe, I don't know, maybe 19. and. Uh, a 12-year-old student I was teaching said, Mr. Rader, have you heard that Elvis died? And I said, oh, yeah, right. Yes, if you heard on the, on the news, Elvis died. Of course, back then there was no Internet. It just had to come out on the radio or TV, you know. And I couldn't believe it. And I think anybody, anybody that has lived that era 
they will know where they were when Elvis Presley died. And if they lived when President Kennedy was shot, they can tell you where they were when President Kennedy was shot as well. I was 16 years old and I had came home from um, high school. High school had already began back on August the 16th and I was in my downstairs and I was so upset. Uh, I, I, I was crying. I, did, I didn't know what to think about that the whole king of rock and roll had passed away. And I was wishing, I couldn't drive, I, I, I could see but I couldn't drive, but I was wishing that I could come to Graceland and be a part of the growth that came here that at those next few days. We got married on July 30th, and you'll, you'll appreciate this, I know, because I, I believe 816 is a big number with you, which is August 16, 77. And uh, we returned to Wichita, Kansas after our honeymoon to the news that Elvis Presley passed away. I remember hearing it on the radio. Uh, I'll never forget it. I, I had was out applying for jobs because there I was married and didn't have a job. Uh, in that time uh, and in that town, you could go get a job like that. I went and got a job that I knew was gonna last for six months because I knew when we were leaving. It was uh, predetermined. We'd already set a bit of a calendar in place. And uh, so those are special moments in life when you remember something like uh, uh, Elvis Presley, he had, and by the way, was a great influence on my life. Gospel quartets, uh, that music uh, that we were so involved in through my high school years, uh, big influence. I was at home. I had just gotten up because I had been with him until about 5:30 in the morning. He said we were talking upstairs. He said he was going to go play racquetball. I said to him, "Well, I got my stuff in my car. I'll play with you." He said, "No, go on home, get some sleep because we start on tour." tomorrow and you're going to be busy. So I was home and I got a call that he was on his way to the hospital. Yeah, sure. I was uh, I was at home. I uh, turned on the TV. I heard uh, news media saying that Elvis Presley has passed away. Obviously, I did not want to believe it, so I flipped the channel. Same thing. Four, five channels. They all had the same thing. Finally, realized that it was true. Um, I cried my eyes off for a week. Shut the world off for a week. My mama consoled me, told me that, the, you know, I would be okay, and I, I was mad at Elvis for leaving me. I was selfish. I was mad at Elvis, but then I kind of understood that the man was human, and um, here I am. I forgave him, and I, I love him. When Elvis passed away, I was uh, in my car, actually. And, uh, well, this is the 38th anniversary of his death. And I was in my car when I came, and I just came to a complete halt right where I was at. And just in disbelief, just sat there for 10 or 15 minutes, just in disbelief, in tears. I was, uh, I was driving from my mother's house to my house, and I heard on the radio they started talking about you know, Presley's death. And I just, you know, I wasn't real sure. I thought maybe you know, maybe, you know, Vernon had died or somebody in the family had died. Somehow I had this, you know, I had this bad, you know, feeling that, that you know, it might be Elvis. And, and when I, you know, when I got home, I mean, they said on the radio Elvis, but I, I still had maybe, you know, just, just some like disbelief about it until I got home and it, it was all in the news. And man, you know, I, I, I just, I cried like a baby, man. I was, I was devastated. Losing Elvis Presley, you know. So uh, that's that's when I, you know, I, I actually didn't I didn't work for a couple of weeks, and uh, you know, some some friends of ours said, you know, the best thing you could do is, is you know, keep doing his songs because there really wasn't there weren't any you know ETAs around back then, you know. I was doing Elvis before he died, so uh, you know, I said, well, I'll, I'll give it. A, you know, I said I, I'll do it for a while. I, I talked to my band and. So let's try it for a little while. And uh, I said, we'll try it for a few months. And I said, well, maybe we'll try it for a couple years, five years. And now it's been, you know, I've been doing it for a long time. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was nine years old, and I believe I was in the backyard playing, playing in the dirt. <laughs> Imagine that. And I went inside the house, and my parents were discussing, hey, Elvis died. Dang, if I know, I can't remember that. I should remember that, and I should remember about John Kennedy too, and I don't remember where I was then. I'm not very good at remembering things. I, mean, I was in Nashville uh, 
at uh, 16, I think it's 16th Avenue South. Did you hear it on the radio? Yeah. I just uh, came out with a record called Cajun Born, and Elvis passed away that, that morning. And like I said, um, you know, it just, that was a hard part. King's part. Gone. Yeah, gone. But you know what I do have? Next to my TV, I got a sticker, bumper sticker that says, I miss Elvis. And somebody sent me an Elvis Christmas card with his face on there and wearing a Santa hat. I cut it out and I got that stuck up there too. We have it photo in, in, our, in so, our music room. So it's Elvis really, lives at our house. Right. And we have his photo in, in, uh, in our music room as well for inspiration. You know, when you want to get some mood, That's it. you look at Elvis and, and he, he'll give you and something. And he's better. got it, Elvis, I got it. But I got a thing that Tater Red down on Bill Street made me an Otis Redding shrine. So I got that over in the corner too. Oh my God. That was, uh, I was at work actually. Um, I was working at a at a, an electronics company and um, uh, they had the radio playing. And I heard that and I mean, I was just, I was just uh, awestruck that that happened. I, I like, started crying actually. So. <laughs> Well, there was a thing, a saying goes that says, before Elvis there was nothing. And Elvis brought along rock and roll and everything else. Now, Elvis, it's not so much his death that changed the world, it was his living, okay? Because he started things like the jumpsuit and the different types of music and so forth. And this is what's changed the music throughout history so far. And his death just brings together more fans. Uh, just like with the ETAs, we're a family, we're all brothers in this business. And our first primary concern is Elvis's music and keeping his music alive. Oh, I just got off the bus coming home from work and uh, I stopped in a dry cleaner store to pick up some of my clothes and my uh, childhood friend that I grew up with just happened to run it by me and I thought he was like, a, I told him that's not, that's not uh, very funny, it's not a joke. And uh, just as he was telling me that, it came on the radio too and... I guess I reacted just like everybody else just tore me up, you know, and uh, felt it for weeks, months, years, to this day, you know, it's really uh, it's a tragedy, a big loss, probably one of the biggest losses uh, known to man of this day and time. It, it, it's never gone away. I mean, now as far as the press coverage right at the time, I think it went on pretty, pretty solid for, oh, a week or two, maybe. Oh yes, can you tell me about the press coverage? Uh, yeah, it was, uh, I think it went on pretty solid for a week or two there, you know, I mean, it was on, on the evening news every time you turned around, it was in the paper. Uh, every day it seemed like there was a new article about, of course, you know, the first, the day after Elvis died was when you got the first uh, press coverage in, the, in, the, in print, and then, then the, uh, the 18th, then there was the, uh, I think it was the day of the funeral. And so you got that coverage and then this person and that person came out of the woods with an Elvis story and, and it was, there was a lot of, I mean, it just went on and on and on. But uh, as we know now, even though the everyday coverage stopped in the general media, he still, Elvis is still big news. I mean, they still, they still will show up out here on the grounds of Graceland, you know, during Elvis week to film things, you know, and it's because Elvis has just never stopped being in the forefront of, of uh, so many people's uh, thoughts and, and, uh, and uh, feelings, you know, and I don't think he'll ever go away, and I don't want him to. When we were in the UK and a news flash came on the TV, uh, we have a, a news program, it's called News at 10. Even to this day we still have a News at 10. And a guy called Reginald Bolzenkett on ITV in England announced that Elvis Presley had died. And then a few minutes later he came back and said, oh I'm sorry we've made a mistake, he's just sick, he hasn't died at all. So it was a sort of sigh of relief and then a few minutes later again, oh no I'm sorry Elvis is dead. So we were up one minute, we were down the next, we were back up again, and we were down, and we stayed there. Well, you know, because Elvis is the, everybody knows Elvis 
is the about the greatest entertainer ever was and the way he affected society and and the world and everything uh, you know it uh, people felt a loss uh, to humanity you know because well, there, there'll never be anybody like him I was at home and uh, everybody just blew up they couldn't believe it you see those crowds outside oh the crowd was outside and people you know I think that was the time when two of the girls I think one, I think it was two got killed or one got killed and one she was saved because she was she was trying to get down here because she had heard that Elvis had passed I think that kind of upset a lot of people but one thing about it God got him with him and he's in God's hand it's something we all got to do. I was in work. I was at the medical group downtown Madison. Did you, did you attend the, uh, the the funeral service? Oh, of course, yes. Can you tell me a little bit about what was going on there? Because I know it was crazy. With the it was unbelievable. It's absolutely, um, in fact, we were like in prison because we could not get, we lived at Grayson. We could get, not get in and out. I've never seen the like of people in my life. It was almost like a plane had flown over and just dropped millions of people up and down the street all over the ground. And it was extremely hot. People were passing out on the lawn and it was just, it was unbelievable, unbelievable. The amount of love and devotion that turned up in such a short period of time. And people from all over the world were here for it. It was unbelievable. August the 16th, 1977 at 2.22 in the afternoon, driving down the interstate in Nashville, I turned the radio on in my 77 Camaro and uh, this DJ goes, it's official, Elvis Presley has passed away. So 15 miles down the road, God's truth, I had all of this written. Now me being a songwriter, I went like this. I was barely six years old when I first heard him sing. And from that moment on, I knew it'd be a lifetime thing. I had no earthly idea that I was writing my life. Six million records now. And that's how I got started. I was playing golf in Nashville, Tennessee, 1977, and uh, somebody wrote up and said, Elvis just died. Well, I started crying, of course, because uh, without him, I wouldn't be here today. Well, I think that it, it was profound because um, if you, you look at how they reacted, uh, it really struck me uh, because it was for about two or three weeks, you know, it was Elvis on the news all the time, and then there were Elvis specials, and uh, you know, Elvis uh, in concert on TV, his last concert. Um, and I think that um, basically it left a void, uh, a huge, huge void, because you know, what would what would he, more would he have been able to contribute um, if you know he had lived for the next 30 to 40 years? I think it would have been even more significant. Uh, because Elvis always managed to uh, evolve with uh, with the time and what was going on in music. And if you look at what they have done uh, with some of his recordings where they've gone back and they've added in new instrumentation and tracks, he's shown that he's better than anybody that's out there today. Um, he's, he's always been cutting edge. I was actually <clears throat> had a, uh, uh, an Arabian mare. My wife and I were showing and raising Arabian horses and I had an Arabian mare on a halter that I was taking her to see if she was ready for breeding in season, as they say, with the stallion that a doctor friend of mine owned. And he came out of the house and told me. He came out of the house and hollering, Sonny, have you heard? And I just knew without him saying nothing, I said, Elvis died. He said, yeah. Isn't that something? And I just fell apart. I let go of the reins, of the halter rope, fell to my knees and started bawling like a baby, saying loudly, he didn't deserve this, oh my God, why? He did not deserve this. And he took the horse and took care of it, my wife, and I, I, I walked over to his fence and had a fence and I walked over and just all of a sudden hauled off and hit the fence and broke that plank. And then I left, I said, I gotta go. Honey, come on. So we left and went home. Phone was ringing off the hook. Family was calling. Friends were calling. I couldn't talk to anybody. Judy, my wife, took all the calls and said I just couldn't talk. And then Red, my cousin, his wife, Pat, showed up at our door. And we just fell into each other's arms, crying like babies, you know. 
He's gone, he's gone, man. Can't believe he's gone. They spent a little time, about an hour and a half or so, too, and then they went on back home. So that was extremely hard, extremely hard on me. It has been since then. It, Elvis's death affected my life. Um, it's, it's difficult to say because I was always a rock and roller, um, right from being a youngster. Um, Elvis to me was the king, he, he still is. But there was also other people. I would, and Elvis was the original rock and roll man. But there were others came up because I, I was a big fan of Buddy Holly, uh, Jerry Lee, Eddie Cochran and Elvis to me was more my sister's uh, influence and I used to like Elvis's early stuff and, and when he went to ballads like a lot of uh, the UK stars uh, into ballads that wasn't rock and roll to us and, and then uh, as we came back we were invited we came to Memphis and then I realized what Elvis is about and when he passed away, it was, it, well, it was like something took a piece of it. And then coming back here to Memphis for Elvis Week, that piece has been put back. I drive a truck and I heard it in the, in the truck at the time. Yeah, I was, I was bummed out. I was sick. I couldn't believe it. My friends would always make fun of me because they were into the Beatles and Led Zeppelin and stuff. And I was this greaser with slicked hair and the rolled up t-shirts like, you know, grease. And, and they would always make fun, hey, Tally, Elvis is dead, you know. And, yeah, you know, I'd go take a walk. And then one day, when he did die, none of those guys teased me. None of them. They all felt bad that Elvis died. And I, I, was, oh, I was messed up. Nah. I think the world went into mourning. Uh, it's actually probably the biggest event that, that you could put in history as far as, you know, everybody knows where they were when Elvis died. Elvis, Elvis's death and 9-11. Uh, it's probably two biggest main events that people can remember, but um, I really don't know how it affected the music industry. I mean, I know how Elvis affected the music industry. I don't know how his death affected it. Um, usually when somebody that famous dies, they, they get more famous after their death, as Elvis did. Uh, it usually takes a death to, to really get people to pay attention to their life. Um, Elvis, uh, Elvis was the king. He was, he was, he started, he, he affected a lot of people in the music industry as far as, uh, I'm losing the words, I don't have vocabulary. He had a big impact, let me just say that. There was something about Elvis that touched everybody, most everybody anyhow. And it's just like a lot of these uh, Down syndrome kids and, and autistic and all, kids that are, are in wheelchairs and stuff, for some reason, you can you can play any kind of music you want to him, but Elvis is what touches him. There's just something about it. There's a spiritual thing. Well, I was working second shift in a nightclub uh, at Day Entertainment, Night Entertainment in Wichita, Kansas. All the clubs are private in Kansas. And uh, I just got up, my daddy told me Elvis had died. And I thought my world was over. Oh, well, it was cool. It was cool, and it's give me a, yeah. It hurts me a lot. I go home, <laughs> I go home from school to go home to, my mom says, what are you coming to do? I said, oh, mom, Elvis is dead. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. And so what, Elvis is dead? Said, mom, I'm a fan, you know what it is. But my mother has not a connection, the emotion that we have, you know. I had seen him three weeks earlier. We lived over off of Southern Avenue, my, my wife and children. And I heard it off television. And when I heard it, I just went out the back door and sat down on the steps and cried. Because I'd just been with him three weeks earlier. I was driving home from work. It was on the radio, and I actually had to just pull over to stop. I wasn't sure if it was a prank or a joke. And the longer it went, the more I understood it was real. And it just hit really hard. 
It had been several years ago, but I was just coming home from work when I heard it. Actually, I was at college orientation at UCF in Orlando on the 15th. I stayed over that night and I came home and my, my mother, we were watching Merv Griffin or something and the news flash came on. Memphis, Tennessee, Elvis Presley has died. That was, that was it, I remember that. Well, the last time I saw him alive was at the University of Maryland, Cole Fieldhouse, when he did a uh, concert there. But I did not talk to him. It, it was a bad day for him, I think. I've heard people say that that was probably the worst they'd ever seen him. And, and I think he was just not well. Uh, and I don't remember when it was, but 74, 5, 6, right in there somewhere. But the last time I was really with him was at Graceland after he came back from the Army. And it was just a gathering of friends. And uh, he was seeing Anita Wood then. And uh, I just stayed and talked and visited. And, uh, and then we left. And uh, the way he said goodbye, and he was not real happy. You know, his mother was gone. And, uh, and uh, I think he had a lot of worries on his mind and things. Well, you know, he, he wasn't the kid I knew before. And uh, when I left, he came out to the car. And, Hugged and kissed my mother, and then he hugged and kissed me. And uh, when we left, mother just looked at me and smiled, and she said, "I think that was goodbye." And it was. I didn't see him anymore after that. I was going to college and working, and uh, I didn't have any playtime. Uh, you know, th that's a good question because you know I asked my mother uh, that question because you know I was uh, seven years old when he passed away, and uh, you know he, she said that I was uh, in a movie with my father. So you know. Uh, I get to hear it afterwards when I'm back for, uh, from the movie, so, yeah. Um, don't remember it that well, but, you know, still, uh, it's, it's a part of my life, that also, you know, so. This event that we come to now, this Elvis Week, uh, would something like that have, have come about had uh, Elvis not passed away and people felt so strongly about him? Uh, I don't think so. I think... Uh, First of all, I think Elvis would have maybe been embarrassed to have a whole week named after him. I know he was used to the adulation and stuff like that, but, but I think it might have embarrassed him to, to be, uh, uh, you know, loved in that degree. But, uh, you know, his death has affected so many books have come out and, and uh, well, a lot of the uh, CDs and stuff that have come out on Elvis, they've gone back into the archives and they've pulled out alternate takes and outtakes, things that, that were never meant to be heard by the general public. But people are hungry for it, and so they drag these things out. I mean, these are things, sometimes Elvis is cussing on them or this or that, whatever, you know. And I don't think he would have ever wanted most of his fans to hear that. He never thought they would. But uh, people are just hungry for that, for anything. Elvis, and I think that's part of how it affected the world. I mean, you know, problems still go on and wars still go on, but so does Elvis. Elvis still goes on and, and uh, people will always love him and uh, I will and I know s scores of people who, who will. And uh, I know there's tens of thousands, millions all over the world. You know, you can look around down here at the tent and just see people just everywhere. And everybody's there for the same reason. It's just because they love Elvis. Well, you know, Elvis passing away, obviously it took away the greatest uh, entertainer in human history. I mean, there's, ne there's never been anybody like him, and I don't think there ever will be again. Uh, you know, he's got a legacy that, that, you know, obviously lives on. I mean, here we are, what, 37 years later, and uh, it's, it's just incredible to see, uh, excuse me, 34 years later, incredible to see how, you know, how his uh, how he lives on through his fans. And, and uh, you know, I'd, I'd, give, uh, I'd give my right arm to have 10% uh, of the Elvis fans around the world. I'd be a really lucky man. The world stopped. I mean, it just completely stopped that day. I mean... To this day, when you watch footage of it, it's just unbelievable just how much it affected and still affects the world today. I mean, his music will never die. I think when the guy passed away, it just affected the whole world, though. Not just music or uh, people who love country or music or rock and roll music, all different kinds of music. 
uh, the guy shook the world when he died, and and this is the, the result of, of of this week and and ev every year is is the fact that Elvis graced us with his presence and you know he came onto the planet and he left us with such a huge impression of the whole music industry. You're not going to believe this. I am a nurse and I was working at Baptist Hospital in 1977. I was a scrub. I was scrubbing on a case in the OR at Baptist Hospital. And uh, one of the nurses said, Kathleen, they think they brought it, I mean, they, they say they brought in Elvis and he's dead downstairs in the emergency room. And we know you love him. So I got one of the residents and he took me down to the emergency room. Reluctantly, um, here I was, 19 years old, right out of, well, no, I was, I was 20, uh, let's see, I was going to nursing school, I was, n no, I was 20, 22, and um, I told a resident <clears throat> that if he didn't get on his white coat and go down to the emergency room and take me with him, that I was going to make his life bad, <laughs> but we went down there, and Elvis was there, and uh, it was a very sad time. I can imagine, that had to be awful. Well, the resident got, I mean, here I was trying to be a, you know, when you're young, you're kind of fearless and, and, and tough talking. And so the resident took me right up to the stretcher where they were working on Elvis. And he said, you touch him. And I said, no, I'm not. And he says, he says, I don't want you to come back to, I'm not coming back down here again. You, you know, he's dead. And it was just, I, I remember just walking away, just kind of crying and, and thinking, why did I do something so stupid like that? And, you know, uh, gosh, part of the family is gone. You know, part of my, my uh, uh, adolescence is gone. So. That is uh, amazing, though. It, it, it really is amazing. You know, looking back, I, I don't know why I did anything like that. I, I, I wouldn't have done that, you know, but I guess because I was so young and so, spur you know how kid kids are, they just kind of impulsive and, um, but it was very sad. It was like witnessing your brother, you know, passing away. Well, there was a guy, I don't know the exact circumstances, but you know, people were just piled out into the street uh, trying to get close to the gates and the walls and stuff like that. Because they just were, uh, they, they, they came to Memphis in droves. They just dropped, it was like they dropped whatever else they were doing and they came to Memphis. Well, this guy somehow or other lost control of his car and the car went into the crowd. And, and these two girls were killed. And it was a, you know, a terrible, terrible thing. And, uh, but like I said, I don't remember the exact circumstances of what was wrong with the, why the guy did that. but. Every single newspaper in the UK carried the news that Elvis had died. There wasn't a single newspaper that didn't mention him and he was on every front page. He was on every TV station. Everybody just changed their program schedules to feature Elvis. And when everybody just came into Memphis from all four corners of the world, believe me, that, that, that week all roads led to Memphis. And we heard in the UK that uh, two young girls had been tragically killed by a drunk driver. And we, we just felt for them, we, we really did, as we felt for Elvis. I mean, at the end of the day, they were there because they wanted to be there for Elvis, just like we all did. And uh, I've, even to this day, I, feel, I still feel sorry for those girls. That was on uh, the evening of August the 17th, uh, that Wednesday. Uh, Mother and I and my sister Debbie had been there all day again on that second day. And it was towards the evening. I remember it was brutal hot, man. It was hot, and it wasn't like nowadays where everybody walks around with their water bottles and uh, you know, uh, camel bags and you know, people were out there just dropping like flies in '77. Nobody had a drink. Nobody had nothing. There wasn't a there wasn't a breeze to be bought for 200 miles around Memphis, Tennessee. It was thick. It was hot. It was humid. It was August, and uh, I had to get out of that crowd. I'd been at the gates there with my mother and sister and, and the ladies I mentioned earlier their friends and uh, next door to Graceland was a, a church it's now the 
Elvis Presley Enterprises corporate offices, but I remember that church being there. And it was a nice little grassy knoll with some shade trees at the top on the north side of Elvis's rock wall. And I had uh, found my way out of the crowd and walked up that hill and went and sat under an oak tree. Still there. Every time I drive by, I see it. I sat there in the root system of that little old, uh, on top of that little hill and uh, pulled out a cigarette, you know, didn't want mama to see him, smoking a cigarette up there. And I'd been there probably for 30, 40 minutes, maybe an hour, but it was some shade and it was cooler, the grass around it and stuff, not in that thick crowd anymore. But sitting there under that tree on that uh, church's front lawn, I was distracted looking at something else and I heard a thump. And I looked, and in that sea of heads, which I was just above enough to look over the crowd, I didn't see what happened. But something caught my eye from above. Something had dropped from the sky. There were news helicopters, you know, probably small airplanes and everything at that time. But something had been dropped from one of those aircraft, is all I could think, because what I saw was. It looked like a bag of laundry or something fell from the sky and landed in the crowd. And I remember looking up at the area, looking for the helicopter that might have come from. There were a lot of them in the sky. And found out later, you know, that it, it had been, God bless her soul, one of those girls hit by that car and knocked into the air. And when I was looking away and when I looked back, uh, Bless her soul, she was uh, falling back down, and I thought it had originated from above. When everybody's gathering outside uh, Graceland and they heard the news that uh, some joint driver went out of control and, and hit a couple people there. There were some girls that got hit by a, a car at the uh, gate that were standing, you know, waiting to. It, it was just mass hysteria, all these fans and stuff, and then a drunk driver ran up in the. And I killed a couple of girls, I remember that too. We met them sometime about 9, 10 o'clock that night. We talked for a while. Uh, there was people pitching tents, doing different things. They were sleeping on the, the sidewall. Uh, and I, it was the next night, whenever the junk driver came down through and hit some people. We talked to him about 15 minutes before this happened, and then me and a friend of mine left, went across the street. Uh, at the time, there used to not be no Graceland Plaza and stuff up through that. It used to be just little shop centers. There was a barbecue shop right across the street. And uh, in the barbecue shop, they had a jam box. And on that jam box, they had all of the was the song. Uh, and uh, we were sitting there and eating, and uh, about a couple, I guess about five, ten minutes later, we heard a great big old crash. And then once we got through, we seen all the ambulances and stuff coming through. We went back across the street and we heard about everything that happened. I woke up a month later, it's like I was just waking up from being asleep. A month? Later. Oh my God. But now, now, I got close to his daddy. He come to the hospital one month from the day of Elvis's funeral from Elvis' death, excuse me. He was there on September 16th with me. That was very nice of Spent him. the evening. It affects me a lot, man. Yeah, like every day, every day style. Elvis, man, he came out on the scene of 55. He did the 50s, he did the rock and roll scene. He did, uh, he did the 60s, he did the movies thing. The 70s, man, he did the concerts. The, uh, he was crowned king, really crowned king in like 73. I mean, it was just crazy, you know? And, uh, he, he lived his whole entire life for us to give the people Elvis Presley because that's what they wanted. And then he passes away at such an early age. And it kind of brings you down to like, you know, as, as, great, as great as he was, I believe he was an angel. I, I mean, he was a human being, yeah, but he was more. I believe he was something more, but he still went. You know, he still left us, you know, and, and it just kind of brings you back down to so, you know. As great as everything is, you better soak it up. You better soak it up and enjoy every second because you never know when it's going to be over. You never know. I was just out of college in, in 77. And, uh, you know, I was at work and 
and people are starting to talk about Elvis passing away, it's like, you're kidding, right? You know, I mean, that, that's pretty much the reaction everybody's got from the whole world. You're kidding. You're, you're, you're pulling my leg. But, well, I tell you, that, it wasn't. And it's like, holy cow, you know, 42 years old, that's crazy. And so, it's, uh, you know, it's a big point in history. And it's something you're not going to forget. I think Elvis' death had a big impact on the world. Um, it was quite a shock, you know. And, um, well, you know, the, 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 the world of uh, music has, you know, been the same since. Not only for the fact that he, you know, he left us, but for the fact that he left quite a footprint in the world of music, pretty much, and had such an impact on everything that we still remember him now, as you can see. So it's, you know, I think that's how it has affected everything. Yes, we did. Yeah, it was it was covered on all the news stations when uh, when Elvis passed away, and every, you know, when you turn every channel over and uh, it, it was covered 24-7. You've got to remember in those days, uh, the UK only had four TV channels and uh, it, there was heavy, heavy coverage and anybody was anybody as far as uh, broadcasting was concerned flew to Memphis and they just covered the whole thing. And we, as British Elvis fans, you know, felt it immensely. There were, I think there were 16 white limousines <clears throat> and uh, uh, we went down to the Forest Hill Cemetery, which is about, uh, uh, oh, about seven or eight miles north of Graceland. Oh, yeah, north of Graceland. And they were lined up and down the highways, two or three deep. People listening on transistor radios to the news and watching us, and they were waving and blowing kisses and all. It was a very, uh, very moving situation for me. Yeah, the day of the funeral, that would have been the 18th, Thursday, August 77. Uh, we'd been down there, like I said, for the last two days, and not much time away. My mother, you couldn't drag her away. Like I said, I was a long-haired little teenage boy, and a couple of days of that, and I was just about burnt out on it, to be honest with you. Mother and sister, they have no way you could keep them away. They'd come up out of the bed, grabbing the car keys, and let's go back down there. Of course, I remember that first day, first evening, uh, we parked there almost directly across the street in a little open lot. And the second day, we were quite a ways down north of there in another open field, I think where the Shoney's used to be. But that third day, we were all the way down at Winchester in Elvis Presley Boulevard, where the bank is now. It was an open field. Nothing really developed around there too much. Uh, not like it is now. But on that day of the funeral, there were millions of people there. Uh, press, press coverage and helicopters and stuff all in the sky. And it felt like we walked a mile to get up as close as we could, but the crowd was so thick and so packed that you couldn't advance very much further towards Grayson. We didn't actually get up to the house, but we were there about, I don't know, maybe within 50, 100 yards north of Grayson. And I stood on the sidewalk, and it was 10 people deep as the procession went by. All those white limousines and hearses and Cadillacs. I remember that, seeing all those, and I remember my mother just breaking down uh, the three days of taking a toll on her, and, and she kind of passed out. While the procession was going by, they were taking Elvis to his final resting place there at Forest Hill Cemetery, and, and I just remember I was uh, proud for Elvis. Uh, for that incredible turnout. It, it was uh, a bigger crowd than, than probably any concert he'd ever got to do. It was a bigger crowd than, uh, than maybe, a, you know, been to any concert of anybody. Uh, I'd say you know, a million people must have been out there, and that's not an over-exaggeration. That's exactly what a million people would look like on both sides of a, a street. Uh, even today, you'd say there's a million people. Well, yeah, a long, long time ago. I hadn't thought about it in years, but I remember Mother going down. And, uh, she wiped her out, and my sister and I kind of fanning her and uh, taking uh, time with my mother. I guess they both, like I said, started, most of them, few got there early that afternoon, but most of them started coming in late. But uh, they camped out there around the, the, the wall and stuff from 
can't actually remember what night it was. I think it was on Wednesday night. I was on the 14th. And then he was buried on the 16th, so we stayed out late, late afternoon until sometime early uh, on the Friday. It was on the Friday before we left, late Friday evening. So there was people camping and doing stuff until after the, uh, the funeral. Now, whenever they had the funeral, they after we got through going through the gate and the funeral happened, it was about, I guess, 45, 50 minutes, almost an hour, before they took him from Graceland to Forest Hill Cemetery. Uh, now, when you left Graceland going to Forest Hill Cemetery, the road from Graceland to Forest Hill Cemetery was packed from the gates of Graceland all the way down through this side to the to the, to where they buried him at, all the way back up to Graceland on the other side. So it was, I ain't no telling how many people were there. There was no way I could kind of tell you that, but it was, it was something. Uh, Elvis's death shook the foundation there. It shook it like, it's like, you know, you don't know what you got till it's gone type thing. And then it's like, Elvis is gone, it's like, Elvis is gone, man. Like, he's, he's, you know, he's gone. It, it's, it's not even real, you know? It doesn't even seem real. Look at all this that's happening. I, it affected the world and everything. Because, because he said it, and then when he, he left with it. He left with it, and, and he's, he's going to be crowned forever, man. Forever he's going to be crowned with it. It affected the world in so many ways. It's not even funny. Down, down, to, the, down to everything, man. Down to everything. This tent. Down to Elvis week, man. Down to everything. It, it affects everything. Uh, shoot, who knows, man, if, if, if we would have lived, how, how different everything would be. Um, uh, the anniversaries, the, the get-togethers, the, the family reunion of Elvis fans here and at the next place, at the next place, you know? And it, and it brings you closer to the man because we miss him so much and you can feel his spirit everywhere. You know, he, he may be gone, he, but he ain't dead. The death of Elvis Presley affect the world, this is for sure, but uh, the most important thing is what his life did to the world. Uh, he give uh, he give the gold letters uh, to the name of rock and roll, and um, and for sure he he learned to the white people uh, what was the black music, and this changed the world. Not his death, especially, but the way he lives. Well. <clears throat> It was a, a, a terrible moment in history. And it's a moment that I'm sure ever, almost every American who was you know, middle-aged at that time or any young person, they knew exactly where they were and what they were doing when they heard the news that Elvis Presley died. It was a tragic moment because uh, <clears throat> I lost a great friend, the fans lost a, a great talent, and the world lost a great person.